Today we're in Luke, Luke uh, chapter 9, not chapter 2, that'll be in a couple weeks. Luke chapter 9, and um, why don't you stand with me, pick up a Bible, and we'll read these verses together, starting at verse 18, and we'll pray. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 says this, And it happened while as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Or whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for our Lord Jesus. Thank you that he did come, suffer, was rejected, was killed, and was raised for us so that we might be saved. Help us, Lord, follow after him in spirit and truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. It's funny, I think, how language changes with the times. The word awful used to mean awesome. Uh, and now it means basically the opposite. Nice by the way, I learned this this weekend. Nice used to mean foolish. Silly used to mean blessed, if you go back far enough in the, the etymologies. Um, we might understand how meaning changes over the course of centuries from Old English to today, but sometimes technology can speed up the process. Follow used to mean come or go after somebody, as if you're following directions. Now it means who's watching my Twitter feed? Who's on Instagram? Follow. Sometimes we follow people without even realizing we do it. We adopt mannerisms and expressions and attitudes, a lot of times uh, subconsciously from the people around us. If you've ever wondered why a sour attitude seems to be contagious, because we're subconsciously following them. You follow the person right into it. So who we follow, what we follow, is of utmost importance. Who should we follow? We should follow Jesus, and especially for Christians, Christians, we ought to be following Christ. But if we're honest about it, many times it doesn't work that way. Now, we believe in Jesus. We're thankful for his sacrifice at the cross. We've asked him to forgive us our sins. The trouble comes in taking the next step. Following Jesus is to walk in his steps, to do the things that he did, to walk with God the way he walked and all the rest. And that's where many of us falter. It's one thing to believe in him. It's another thing to follow after him. Uh, a lot of people are content to pray a prayer of salvation, but they're not so ready for the commitment of following that comes after it. And that's really the rub. Whereas modern evangelicals often separate salvation from discipleship, the Bible does not. We think back to the Great Commission. Jesus sent out his disciples with the command to make disciples, not converts. Matthew 28, 20. John notes that the person who is in Christ is a person who walks as Jesus himself walked, 1 John 2, 6. And of course, after writing of many of the wonders of the salvation that we have in Christ, Paul wrote how we're to present our own bodies back to Jesus as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1. He wrote how we're to walk worthy of the calling from which we are called, Ephesians 4, 1. So important was this to Paul that he even instructed the churches that he planted to follow him as he followed Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. So the point is, discipleship isn't an option. It's not an add-on to Christianity. It is Christianity. If we're not following Jesus as his disciples, we need to ask ourselves if we're really following him at all. True discipleship is faith that follows Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus desires from us. Now, to this point, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent his apostles on a short-term mission trip around Galilee, and he empowered them to do the same things that he had done. Uh, they cured diseases, they cast out demons, they preached the gospel. Jesus is so powerful, he's got the power to delegate his power. He's the all-authoritative one. And when the disciples returned to him, he took them to a secluded place, 
At least it was secluded for a few moments till the crowds caught up to him there. And Jesus ministered to those crowds all day long. Eventually they became hungry. And of course, as we read last week, that's when Jesus performed the pinnacle of his pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection miracles. And that was multiplying five loaves of bread and two fish for 5,000 men plus women and children. So somewhere between seven and 10,000 people total. And when Jesus did this, he demonstrated the ultimate power, the power of the creator God. Now, that's what the crowd saw, but what would they believe? They saw it happen, but what would they do with that knowledge? What would they actually believe about Jesus? And more than that, how would the disciples of Jesus actually respond to him? Did they truly understand what it was that Jesus was about to face, and thus what they would have to face as well? If Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then he is a Christ that must be followed. Would they do so in faith? Will we? So it starts with a question and answer session, question, confession, we might say, who is Jesus, starting verse 18, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, who do the crowds say that I am? Now, it's really interesting when you do comparison here with the other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark, and that it quickly becomes evident that Luke emits a lot of narrative between the feeding of the 5,000 and this confession here at Caesarea Philippi. And Matthew shows, to take his version, uh, shows you know, the feeding of the 5,000 in his 14th chapter, then it follows it up with Jesus walking on water, confronting the Pharisees, going into Tyre and Sidon to find a single woman, healing multitudes of people, feeding then 4,000 men, plus another women and children after that, and finally more. And then this Q&A session comes along in Matthew 16. Luke leaves all of that out. It's apparent that he, Luke, wants to tie the crowds together, both those who are fed by him and those who spoke about him. What would be the response of those who saw the miracles of Jesus? What were they saying about him? Now, although there's much that Luke chose not to include regarding this lead up to this conversation with the apostles, there is one detail that Luke is absolutely unique in recording, and that's the fact that he was alone praying. There's nothing said about him being with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, which is interesting, considering how often Luke points out the fact that Jesus was among the Gentiles. But there's nothing about the location here whatsoever. Yet there is this tiny detail about Jesus being alone in prayer with his disciples eventually coming to him. So habitual was Jesus' time in prayer that he didn't neglect it anywhere he went. And for us, we often pray when it's convenient for us, when we remember to pray, when it fits into our schedule. And you know, when we get off, we go on vacation, we, uh, things fall aside. For Jesus, it didn't matter what the rest of his day held. He was going to be praying at some point. And while we're here, since it is unique, let's ask this. What's your habit of prayer? Or better yet, do you have a habit of prayer? Do you spend time on a regular basis talking to God, praising him, waiting upon him? And so often for us to fall into this rut of mealtimes, bedtimes, and church time. That being the only occasions that we pray, if that. Have you ever wondered what your spiritual life might be like if that changed? What would happen to your spirit if you spent more time interceding through the Holy Spirit? So, you know, for all the times that we spent just admiring the devotion of men and women of the past, maybe we should stop just admiring and start engaging in it and see what happens. In any case, at some point, the disciples joined Jesus, and that's when he asked them what might seem to be a curious question. Who do the crowds say that I am? And this is curious. Why is it curious? Well, because one... Jesus is the Son of God, and he has no need for us to supply him with information. So why is he asked? Who did the crowd say that I am? Secondly, why is it weird? Because Jesus isn't thick-headed. He could easily tell what the people were whispering among him. And then third, because Jesus isn't egotistical. He's not emotionally dependent on what other people think about him. So yes, this is a curious question, but it's a necessary one. Why? Well, because this question is a setup. If Jesus gets the disciples thinking about the various theories of people concerning himself, then he'll also get them thinking about their own theory of his identity. What we're going to find is that's really what he's driving out all along. Now, that said, crowds do have a tendency to talk, don't they? Rumors fly about all the time about all kinds of things. We live in a golden age of rumors with the advent of social media. News stories and headlines go viral in a matter of minutes before anybody has an opportunity to verify whether they're true or false. And pretty soon we're posting quotes about Abraham Lincoln talked about the internet. The problem with quotes found on the internet, they're often not true. (laughs) Quoted by Abraham Lincoln. 
Just because a bunch of people say something doesn't mean that it's true. Just because a bunch of people agree doesn't make it right. The vast majority of people in the world would currently reject Jesus as Messiah. That's the majority vote. Are they right or are they wrong? Wrong, most assuredly. People can be in full agreement and still agree about the untruth. It's truth that matters. Who people think Jesus is can be totally different than who he actually is. And that difference will make all the difference in the world on Judgment Day. So, verse 19, there's the answer. So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. The apostles said, obviously heard the discussions of the crowds. They were able to relate it back to Jesus. And it's interesting to note that these were exactly the same theories that Herod had heard earlier. We read about that in Luke chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. Herod was apparently feeling guilty about uh, having John the Baptist killed, and he heard all these things floating around about Jesus, wondering about Jesus. And Apparently, these rumors had stuck around for quite some time because, again, this happened long before the feeding of the 5,000. So these rumors stuck around, which goes to show that rumors often get a lot more traction than the truth sometimes. But what were the most common guesses? They're all interesting choices, uh, but the whole thought of it is kind of illogical. Jews, understand, don't at all believe in reincarnation. That idea is completely foreign to their line of thinking. And so this would have to be either Jesus is serving in the same prophetic role as these other people or him having the spirit of someone else resting upon him like Elijah did with Elisha um, or you know the other person being raised from the dead now walking around with the new name of Jesus. Um, possibly those were the only options for him. But in any case, there were several theories. First was John the Baptist. I think, in my opinion, this is the most curious of all the choices because Jesus and John were contemporaries with one another. And unlike Elijah and Elisha, who had a master-disciple relationship with each other, Jesus and John didn't. John, understand, was just a couple of months, few months older than Jesus. And apart from the one brief moment that John baptized him, we've got no biblical evidence whatsoever that they ever publicly associated with one another. That's not to say they didn't talk and do things together. Surely they did. They were cousins. But as far as ministering together, there's no biblical record of that at all. So why would people think that Jesus was John the Baptist? Well, one, their core message was identical, at least at first. They both preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Second, John spent much time speaking of the Messiah in preparation for people to be be the Messiah. Jesus spent a lot of time speaking about the Messiah because he is the Messiah. So maybe there's some crossover there. And then, of course, third, perhaps simply, John was the last major prophet on the scene. (laughs) And so that's the easiest name for people to use. Oh, he's got to be John because he was just there. There's the one we're thinking of. So there's John the Baptist. There's Elijah. And this makes a little bit more sense on several levels. One, Jesus did a lot of miracles, far more miracles than any of the other prophets. And Elijah was known for his abundance of miracles. Second, we know Elijah was expected to return before Judgment Day, Malachi 4, 5. And granted, Jesus taught that Elijah's role was fulfilled somewhat by John the Baptist, but not everybody had heard that. Obviously, not everybody would have believed that. So it's logical that they would think Jesus fills that role. And then third, unlike all the other prophets, Elijah never died. He was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire, which wasn't accompanied by slow motion music and a bunch of people running, by the way. (laughs) But he was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. He's potentially one of the only two people in history who never died, Enoch being the other, Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. So there's another option, a little bit more logical, perhaps. And then the third option is another old prophet, resurrection. This is just kind of the catch-all category. Uh, Matthew includes Jeremiah with this idea, perhaps due to Jesus' abundance of teaching, especially that of judgment. But Mark and Luke both just mention here the other general category of prophets. What makes it so curious is why the people couldn't just accept Jesus on his own. Why is it necessary for Jesus to be someone else from the past? Why couldn't he just be someone new and different in the present? Perhaps it's because the only real possibility that was left to them was a possibility they couldn't bring themselves to face. All that's left at this point is for Jesus to be the Messiah, and he is. So all were interesting guesses, but they were all wrong. Like that old scene from Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade, they chose poorly. Right? Whatever their justification was for believing Jesus was these other people, that was the wrong choice. They believed that Jesus was anyone other than who he specifically claimed to be, which is the Son of Man, the Son of God. 
And so that's when Jesus turns the question back around on the disciples. He says in verse 20, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And this is the crux of the matter. And understand, there's an emphasis here on the Greek personal pronoun. It, this could be translated, but you yourselves, who do you say that I am? In other words, you, you've thought about the crowds, you've heard about the rumors, but what about you? The disciples had spent far more time with Jesus than anybody else. They had seen more miracles. They had heard more teaching. They'd even been empowered by Jesus to go do the same things that he had done all over the land. What other prophet of the past had empowered his disciples, his students, in the same way? So with all that in mind, who did the disciples say that Jesus was? And at the end of the day, that's what's important to us too. Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, you've heard other people talk about him. You've seen some people blow him off, just dismiss him entirely. Some people have a generic respect for him, but don't really pay much attention to him. Others say that they believe that he's God, but they only really think about him Christmas and Easter. Others say that he truly is God and they worship him as such. But that may be all other people. What about you? What about you? Well, my grandmother was a great Christian. Well, praise God for your grandmother. But what about you? And you say, well, that's really a personal question. Yes, it is. It's bound to be. This comes down to an intimate, personal decision. Not about what truth is. Truth is truth no matter what. But it does come down to a personal decision. What you believe about this truth. You must make a decision of what you believe about Jesus. And that's a choice that literally affects the rest of your existence. All the way into eternity. Your whole existence hangs on this very personal decision. No one can make it for you. You are the one that needs to come to grips with Jesus. So the question you need to ask yourself is, have you done it? Some people know they ought to believe, but they put it off, thinking they can always deal with it later. I remember being in that category one time. Oh, this sounds right, this sounds true. I'll get around to that. How wrong. We never know what lies in the days ahead. We don't even know if we'll have another day ahead. If you know you need to make the decision to believe upon Jesus, you need to make that today. Now, the disciples, they knew what they believed, and Peter went on to say in the rest of the verse here, Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. Good answer, good answer. Cue the applause. Everybody, good answer, Peter. Peter's the one who opened his mouth. It seems likely he spoke on behalf of the other uh, 11 apostles, or at least the other 10 apart from Judas. Uh, Peter and the others recognized that Jesus was far more than these other prophets, these other prophetic roles of the past. As great as they were, they were nothing in comparison with the man right in front of them. You know, even if Moses and Abraham had been in the mix, Jesus is greater than Moses and Abraham too. Jesus outweighed them all. And who is he? He is the Christ of God. And again, Matthew's version gives us a little bit more. Here records Peter's full answer, Matthew 16, 16. It's really the, the climax of the gospel of Matthew. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Luke's version doesn't disagree in the slightest, doesn't contradict in the slightest, just sums it up a little bit more. And really, this whole truth is wrapped up in these four words that Luke did include. Jesus is the Christ of God. Uh, we know the word Christ. It's we use it today almost as a name, but technically it's a title. The Greek is Christos. Uh, transliteration is Mashiach from Hebrew. It means anointed one. In most cases, it refers to the, the one who is anointed to be, uh, by the prophet of God, anointed to be king over Israel. When God gave Saul to Israel as king, Samuel went and anointed him with oil, pouring a whole flask of oil on top of his head as a symbol of God's divine choice. 1 Samuel chapter 10. The same thing happened later on with David. He poured a horn of oil on top of David's head, 1 Samuel 16. That role of anointing was passed on from generation to generation among David's lineage, with each successive king being thought of God's anointed one, God's Messiah. So first of all, the thing we see here is that there are kingly expectations with this title. If Jesus is the Christ... He must be the legitimate successor of David, the rightful king of all united Israel. Now we can see how this line of thought would have caused a little bit of heartburn for the Romans. Heartburn for other levels of leadership in Judea. Because if too many people start seeing Jesus as the legitimate king, then they might form an army to start backing him. You know, the Romans don't take competition too lightly at this point in time. People didn't often take the chance of crossing them. Thus, for Peter and for the apostles to say that Jesus is the Christ, that's for them to take a pretty huge personal stand. They were staking their claim with Jesus, come what may. It's a great lesson and a great example here for us as well. There's times we have to make a choice. We're going to stand with Jesus. We're going to stand and make it easy for ourselves. 
Take your stand with Jesus. He is the Christ, the King, the one to whom I owe all my allegiance. But Christ is more than just a a title for a divinely appointed governmental role. It itself is a title of divinity. Now, the Davidic kings, David, and all the rest, they weren't considered uh, divine, but the Jews understood eventually there would be one coming from the line of David who would be. In God's initial covenant with David, you might recall, God promised to raise up a descendant for David whose throne God would establish forever. And that God himself will be called his father, 2 Samuel 6, 13 and 14. The prophet Daniel wrote of Messiah the prince who would come to Israel but be suddenly cut off. Uh, speaking of the crucifixion, later talking about the great tribulation coming in. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. Habakkuk actually wrote of the anointed one of God, using that term Messiah, Mashiach, to bring salvation to God's people in light of his wrath on Judgment Day, Habakkuk 3.13. So they understood there was a man coming, but they also said there was more than just a mere man. This is the divine man chosen with a specific purpose, to save his people, to rule over them forever. So when Jesus was called by Peter, the Christ of God, Peter's saying he's pinning all of his hopes of all of his people upon this one man in front of him. All of Scripture hung upon the Lord Jesus in whose eyes he's looking at that very moment. In essence, he's saying, you, Jesus, are the fulfillment of every prophecy in my Bible. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's huge. That's massive. Of course, that's the same conclusion we all need to make. But again, nobody can make it for us. So there's the confession. Then Jesus responds with a prophecy, verses 21 and 22. He strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. Stop there. Peter's statement was huge. And in light of it, Jesus commanded them to keep this all confidential. Well, why? Considering how often Jesus had openly declared to be the Son of God, uh, right in the heart of Jerusalem, of all places, according to the Gospel of John, why should the confession of Peter and the others remain quiet? Well, because it's one thing for Jesus to say it. It's another thing for people to believe it and start talking about it for themselves. Now, don't get the wrong idea. Jesus wanted people to believe. He wanted them to tell others what he had done. We just think about what he told the former demoniac after he got cleansed of all the demons. Luke chapter chapter 8, verses 39 and 40. Go tell everybody the good things God has done for you. Remember, he even sent the 12 out to go preach the gospel in his name to do the things that he did. Luke chapter 9, verse 1 through 6. So when we talk about these theories about uh, Jesus wanting to keep a so-called messianic secret, those are ill-founded theories. Jesus did send people out to go preach in his name. But there were some aspects that needed to remain quiet, at least for a time. Again, too much talk about Jesus being the expected king of Israel could attract the attention of the Romans, and Jesus still had a lot to do according to God's sovereign plan. Now, he would see the Romans soon enough, and they would indeed crucify Jesus for the official crime of being the king of Israel, but that a lot of things needed to happen before that took place. In addition, we need to consider this, too, that Jesus was possibly thinking about the apostles themselves. Uh, You know, for Jesus to command silence at this point, not just for his own plan, it's for the safety of the twelve. If they started talking too much about a different king, they themselves could easily be arrested and killed. And so Jesus is, again, waiting for the timing of God. They would suffer soon enough, but that needed to come after the Holy Spirit came upon them. But make no mistake, suffering and death was exactly what was in view. Peter confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God. So what did that mean? What did that entail? Jesus explains, verse 22, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Now, this is the first major prophecy of the gospel, we might call it, of the passion in the book of Luke. It won't be the last. Jesus would specifically teach on his passion both prior to his cross and after when he's risen from the dead, saying that it was absolutely central. And it is, it's central to his entire message. Jesus has taught about the kingdom of God. This is how we enter it, by believing upon this son of man who did these things for us. We must believe upon Jesus as a Christ, the son of man to be saved. There are a lot of aspects here. We're going to look into them briefly. First is that the son of man is the Christ of God. Remember, that was Peter's confession of him. You are the Christ of God. Now, although this statement is not back to back with Peter's confession in the other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Mark, Luke puts them back to back for a reason. The belief in Jesus as a Christ and his work as a son of man are inexorably tied together. They go hand in hand. 
As for Luke, there's no doubt in his mind that when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, Jesus is simply picking up from Peter's confession that he is the Christ of God. Thus, when Jesus repeatedly uses this title, Son of Man, it's absolutely clear what his meaning is. He's not calling himself just another man, born of a man like other men. No, he's using the title in his messianic sense, just as it appears in Daniel. The Son of Man is the anointed one of God. The Son of Man is the Son of God. What must happen to him? Well, he must suffer. Question, is this suffering simply a summary of his coming rejection and death? Or is this suffering another aspect of it? Well, yes, both and, right? Most likely is both. Jesus would indeed suffer during the course of his trial and his crucifixion, but the physical, the emotional, the spiritual suffering that he endured had its own role in his sacrificial work. When Jesus hung upon the cross for himself, remember, he took the entirety of God's wrath upon himself that was due for our sin. Everything that we deserved, he suffered. And Jesus could have died. If he just needed to die, he could have died in any number of painless, relatively painless ways. But instead, he died one of the most painful, suffering-filled deaths imaginable. So he must suffer. Second, he must be rejected. Uh, Jesus may have been accepted by the apostles, believed by them to be Christ the King, but he would need to be rejected by the official Jewish leadership. The vast majority of the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, the, the elders, they would reject Jesus as their king. And they would convict him of the charge of blasphemy, which, by the way, they shows that they fully understood exactly what it was Jesus was claiming all along. This itself was a fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 3 tells us, He was despised and rejected by men. And this is the very reason, of course, that anyone at all can be saved. After all, how else would someone go to the cross if he was not first rejected by his people? Third, he must be killed. <clears throat> he must be killed. This is at the very heart of his mission. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And the way he would do it is becoming a sacrifice on their behalf. A sacrifice really on our behalf. He had to be killed. We know from Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without a sufficient sacrifice, everyone is lost. Now the problem is there is no sufficient sacrifice. Even if every single one of every one of the sacrifices of Leviticus 1 through 5 was followed to the letter, there would still never be enough to forever deal with our sin. Why? One, because we keep sinning. But two, livestock, as valuable as it can be, as much money as you can pay for it, will never equal the life of a single human being. What humans require is an equivalent sacrifice, which is what Jesus provides as the Son of Man. There's no salvation without the death of Christ. Fourth, he must be raised. And how crucial this is to the gospel that he must be raised. If Jesus be not raised, then everything else is in vain. What good would it have done for Jesus to do the miracles, to be believed by some by the Christ, to suffer, to die, and been rejected and even killed if he had remained dead. Everything would have been lost. The miracles, nice stuff. Every single one of them had an inherent expiration date. Even the people raised from the dead would die again. People healed of blindness would die. Everything would expire eventually. So their faith would have been useless. Their death would have been deserved. Jesus' death, if he did not rise from the grave, would have been deserved. After all, Jesus claimed to be God. And if he wasn't, then he was rightly convicted of blasphemy, even if the sentence was overly harsh by the Jewish legal standard at the time. But that's not what happened. Jesus was raised from the dead, and it was necessary that he do so in order for us to be saved. He is risen, and his salvation is available to all the world. And you say, it's not Easter yet. Don't preach that. <laughs> we preach it at Christmas. We preach it every other time. Jesus is risen from the dead. Okay, so this is what Jesus predicted about himself. This is what came to pass. Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus did everything that he said he would do and that thus he is a Christ of God? If so, then you need to respond to that. How? One, by consciously and knowingly putting your trust in him, as Peter showed. And then second, by following him as a disciple. And that's what the rest of these verses go on to show in verse 23. What's involved with following Jesus? Verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does it look like to be a disciple? Jesus tells us. Now, before we get to the description itself, notice there is a pre-existing condition. Desire. If anyone desires. 
Discipleship isn't forced on anyone. God doesn't force anybody to become a Christian. Certainly, it is his desire that we do come to faith, but God, he doesn't want to see anyone perish in his sins, but it's not something he inflicts on anybody. Salvation is by no means a punishment. It is something we must be willing to do. Do you want, another way to translate that word from the Greek, do you wish to follow Christ? Do you want to be saved? Are you willing to spend eternity with him? Is that something you desire? You have the free gift of free will to do so. You also have the free will to refuse. If you don't want to spend eternity in the presence of God, you don't have to. But know this, you will spend eternity somewhere, and the Bible tells us there's only two options. There's heaven and there's hell. And the common objection that's raised to that is, well, that doesn't sound like that's much of a choice. <laughs> Answer, well, that ought to make the choice pretty darn easy. Yeah. Keep in mind that although we get to make our own choices, we don't get to pick our own reality. Truth is what truth is. A person might not like a binary choice between heaven or hell, but that is what exists. We have to deal with the reality. And God would save us from hell. That means we must choose to believe upon Jesus and follow him. And that's a good thing. Heaven's not some place that people are going to regret once they get there. Not a single person in heaven is going to be bored or depressed or gloomy, wishing that they were somewhere else. Well, want to be there because Jesus is there. And in any place where Jesus is, heaven is right with him. So desire is the condition if someone truly wants to follow Jesus to be his disciple, then there needs to be a response. There needs to be a way from moving from willing to action, and that's what Jesus goes on to teach in three steps. First, there must be denial. Denial. Deny yourself. Deny himself. Now, that's the opposite of our American culture, is it not? We're always trying to better ourselves, seek out the things that make for our happiness and all the rest, and that's not necessarily evil, but it certainly doesn't get us into the kingdom of God. Following after our own pleasures won't get us following Jesus. Now, don't get the wrong idea. Following Jesus does not mean being miserable. To deny yourself is not spinning your ways, looking to make yourself suffer as much as humanly possible. Say, oh, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm so bad. It just means keeping the right priorities. Our culture says me first. Christianity says God first. Following Jesus means we seek the glory of God and let him add anything else that he desires along the way. More than that, it means to deny ourselves sin. Uh, you know, when Jesus says the disciple must deny himself, the main idea is to deny the flesh, to deny the sinful desires that are inherent in us. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6, 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, count yourself as dead to those sinful things that you used to enjoy, the lust, the greediness, the pride, the lies, Whatever, lay those things aside in denial and follow after Christ in newness of life. So there's denial, and then second, there's death. Death, he says, take up his cross daily. And in a very real way, this goes along with step one. Again, Paul said, reckon yourselves dead. He's not just using a dramatic metaphor, right? Just as Jesus picked up his cross, we're to do the same. We need to die to this world and live for the glory of God. And it's, I think, interesting, sadly so, how people so often want to whitewash this. Today, when people say, oh, I'm bearing my cross, I mean, I, I've experienced some sort of inconvenience. My job's hard. I'm bearing my cross. I got a difficult people I want to deal with. I got to bear my cross. I've got a rock in my shoe. I'm bearing my cross. The, the phrase is watered down so much that it's practically meaningless. Now, when Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily, it means on a day-by-day -day basis, we need to die cross is nothing less than a death sentence. It's been said that the road to the cross is a one-way trip. It's a death sentence, and it's a painful death sentence at that. It certainly wasn't mere inconvenience. Few things are more dramatic than death. That's what we're called to do. For some people in this room today, there's something in your life that needs killing off. It needs to die. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's a habitual sin. Maybe it's something that's become an idol in your life. Maybe it's some issue of unforgiveness. It needs to die. That's not something you just deal with as you stare at it in the corner of your life every now and again. No, you need to die to it. Make the choice to do so. Pick up your cross of death and die to the thing that would keep you from wholeheartedly following Jesus. Because whatever that thing is, I guarantee you it's not worth it. 
So there's denial, there's death. Third, there's direction. Direction. The cross isn't something we simply pick up. We've got to take it somewhere. We follow Jesus. We walk where he walked. We do the things that he did. We love the way he loved. We pray the way he prayed. You name it, the things he did, the way he lived his life is the way we ought to now live our lives. I don't know if you did this. I did this when I was a little kid. I used to find my daddy's shoes and jump into them and walk around and think how big I was and how cool it would be in an adult one day. In a sense, that's what we do with Jesus, right? We want to walk around in his sandals, walk around in his footsteps, walking like a mature citizen of the kingdom of God. More than that, a fellow co-heir of the kingdom itself. It does come with a cost. Look at verse 24. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Bit of a paradox here, isn't there? A paradox, it's a statement that seems senseless or self-contradictory. How does somebody save his life by losing it? Vice versa, how does one lose his life by saving it? It seems absurd. It's not. This is the paradox of the gospel. The cost of discipleship is to lose our lives for Jesus. But if we do, we'll find that our lives have been saved for all eternity. It's like all those movies that show a person hanging onto a cliff for dear life. You know, and if they just let go of their grip there, they can be grabbed by the other person waiting to save them. That's the way it is with us in Jesus. So many people have grabbed hold of their own sinful desires and their own lustful desires and sins, thinking that's the only way they can get what they want. That's the only way they can get through life. But if they just let go of those things and trusted Jesus to save them, they would find that Jesus gives them so much eternally, infinitely more. And all it takes is a bit of perspective. People grab hold of this world thinking that this world is all I got, so I better squeeze it for everything that it's worth. And it's not. The 70, 80, 90 years that we spend here, that's a drop in the bucket in comparison with eternity. Guess what? We were created to be eternal beings. What good is 70 years worth of riches if the next 7,000 are spent in suffering? What value is three minutes of sin in comparison to eons yet to come? Jesus could not have put it in more starker terms. What is at stake is absolute destruction and nothing, nothing, nothing is worth that cost. Verse 26, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. What does it mean to be ashamed of Jesus? Well, it's kind of a sobering thought. What the Lord speaks of here seems to be so unthinkable that we might want to, you know, let's look at this in the Greek to see if there's some sort of shade of meaning that makes this better for us, makes it more palatable. Sorry, No. The Greek word means to experience a painful feeling or sense of loss of status because of some particular event or activity. So ashamed is a perfectly good translation here. What makes this difficult for us to swallow is that the shame goes two ways. One is from men and the other is from Jesus. Those who are ashamed of Jesus will find that Jesus is ashamed of them at his coming. Those who deny Christ today will themselves be denied by Christ later. That's the most serious thing indeed. Now, Part of the problem here is I think we often hear this verse out of context. We typically hear this verse quoted at altar calls, and contextually, this isn't referring to them. This is not hesitancy in responding to the gospel. This is shame in being associated with Christ at all. This is entirely rejecting the gospel, finding it to be shameful, and thus rejecting Jesus right alongside of it. But as Christians, that doesn't completely let us off the hook. Some people, though claiming to believe in Christ, still feel shame to publicly associate themselves with Christ. And so with Christians, and maybe we should say when cultural Christians start apologizing for the gospel, start apologizing for the scriptures, when we start to shy away from the claims of Christ, I don't want to be associated with that, then they're demonstrating shame in Jesus himself. When people who claim to be Christian don't want to be known as Christian or disciple or follower of Christ, I'm not picking a particular title of mine, but when you don't want to be associated with Jesus, that's being ashamed of him. Now, this isn't necessarily talking about fear and sharing your faith, though fear can lead to shame. It's talking about downright denial. This is the person who shows up in church yet doesn't want anything to do with Jesus outside the building. This is the person who calls him herself Christian, you know, just because they're not Jewish, they're not Muslim, they're not Hindu, or any of those other things. So this is the box I check off on my census list. But don't want to be known by him outside of that census form. If that's you, hear this clearly. Eternity does not hang on whether or not your name is on a church membership somewhere. 
where you spend the next 1,000 years, 2,000, 3,000 years, is not based on whether or not you claimed to be a Christian. It's whether or not you actually are one. You need to believe upon Jesus today and actually follow him. So talking about Jesus, the Son of Man, coming in his glory, brings up another event about to come very, very soon. Jesus gives a little bit of preview here in verse 27 as we start to wrap up. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now this seems to be a rather ambiguous statement about from Jesus. There are, are many theories as to what he meant by it. Some believe that the kingdom literally came in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Obviously, though, it did not because there's a lack of fulfillment of the prophecies of Jesus' return. Others believe that Jesus here prophesies the Spirit coming at Pentecost, and that could be thought of as an initiating of the kingdom of God, but it doesn't really fulfill the most central aspect here of you know, seeing Jesus ruling over the world as king. Most likely, it speaks of the miracle of the transfiguration, which we'll look at next week, and it happens literally in our text in a week's time, of Jesus' conversation here, in which a handful of apostles, some here, some were witnesses. There, those disciples did see Jesus in his glory, like we read in verse 26, and they get an actual taste of the kingdom because Jesus is standing there with Moses and Elijah. So that's a marvelous privilege enjoyed by three of Jesus' disciples in immediate fulfillment of the prophecy. They were disciples because they followed Jesus. Discipleship is faith that follows Jesus. And boy, do we have a Jesus worth following. He is the Christ of God, the divine Son of Man who sacrificed himself for us. He suffered, he was rejected, he was killed, he was raised all so that you and I could receive the forgiveness of God and be eternally reconciled to him. So what else would we do other than walk in his footsteps? What other response could there be than to follow after our Lord Jesus in faith? So guys, let's, you know, enough of the mamby-pamby easy believism where all you got to do is check off a box in order to claim that we're Christian. Enough with the lie that as long as we claim to be Christian, it doesn't matter what we do with Christ himself. Jesus calls us to be disciples and disciples follow jesus so follow him desire to follow him deny your sins to follow him daily die to those sins in order to follow him direct yourself after his example walk where he walked love as he loved worship as he worshiped so christian what's holding you back as believers we can let life get in the way we let memories get in the way. We let all kinds of things get in the way of us following wholeheartedly after our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't put your hand to the plow and look back. No, look at Jesus and keep walking. Follow after him. For those who are not yet believers, ask yourself, what is worth the cost of eternity? God has given you a wonderful gift because he gave you free will. You can desire to follow after Jesus, so use your free will to choose Christ. That's what God desires for you, but you need to desire it as well. You can express to him your desire right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so very much for Jesus. I thank you for the fact that he did come for us, that he did endure all that he endured, the suffering, the rejection, the death. But Lord, I thank you that it didn't end there, that it ended, goes on today in his resurrection. He is alive today. And we thank you that he is. Now I pray, Lord, for any among us today who have not yet put their faith in Jesus, who have not yet confessed him as the Christ of God. Help them see Jesus for who he is. Help them turn away from their sins and cast themselves upon Jesus, asking, save me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Help me follow after you. And Lord, help us all walk as Jesus' disciples. It's so easy to be Christians in name only. Guard us from that tendency, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Help us follow after Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.